I'll be brave if you're brave. I'll be brave, but only if you're brave. Yeah, we can both be heroes, like soldiers in their nice clothes, like soldiers in their nice clothes together. And it could be just you and me. We'll be family. Just wait and see. So I will fight if you'll fight. Yeah, I will fight, but only if you'll fight. Oh, we can make it through this like sailors in a tempest, like sailors in a tempest together. And it could be just you. Just wait and see. So I'll be brave if you're brave. I'll be brave, but only if you're brave. Evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's lung cancer living room. Happy to have all of you in the room. Those of you joining us online via YouTube and Facebook Live, welcome, welcome. For those of you who may not know me, I am Danielle Hicks, and I oversee uh, patient program services and education here at the Adario Lung Cancer Foundation. I am also one of Bonnie's daughters. The oldest. Um, the oldest, the oldest daughter, the youngest one who most of you know um, couldn't be here tonight. She's, she fell ill. Right. So I was ill last month. It's her turn this, yeah. this month. We're so excited to have you all here tonight um, to talk about science in early detection of recurrence. Um, and, and a companion diagnostics, um, it's a blood test to detect this recurrence. Um, so we're really, really excited to talk to you guys about, about what's going on in that space. We've got Dr. Paul Billings, uh, Joanne Barrage, who most of you know, she attends the living room um, on a regular basis. So with that, we're going to jump into me asking you all, you last, to um, introduce yourselves and say a little bit about why, why you're here tonight. Sure. So. Um Everyone who's working on this at Natera, and I bet everyone in this room and people listening, we all hope that we can prevent new cancers, other cancers in our family, in the families of the people who are in this room. But we also hope that we can cure the disease once it's present. And um, what we're gonna tell you about today is about a research assay, a research test, which will in about a month be available as a clinical test. And uh, over time, we'll likely take it to the FDA and have it become a regulated test, uh, which is um, a new way to detect uh, the presence of disease once it's been diagnosed. We call it molecular residual disease, MRD. Sometimes that's in the literature, you'll see that used, and it'll actually be minimal residual disease. It's really, uh, it was developed as a way to assess after an intervention, after a treatment, what was left? And was there any uh, evidence of disease left? The same test applied consecutively over time can help you track, and we'll show you an evidence from Joanne, uh, the recurrence of a cancer that's already been diagnosed, or can uh, potentially also track response to treatment, whether that treatment is working, whether it's slowing down in its effectiveness, or whether, in fact, it's not working at all. And we think our contribution to the hope is that we think that uh, this will, the availability of this test and its remarkable properties 
will really significantly add to the management and hopefully to curing more patients with the armamentarium of drugs and surgery uh, that are available and, and radiation that are available for lung cancer patients and in fact actually for lots of other uh, cancer uh, survivors. So before uh, Alex uh, launches into sort of a description of the test, uh, I, I just thought I'd, I'd, I'd prick you a little bit by saying, how do you define a cure uh, in someone who has non-small cell lung cancer, or actually any cancer? And there, uh, there, it's no, there's no real easy definition. Once you've had it, you're changed. Uh, but so, how, but how does one define it? Well, one way is if you let's say you have surgery, and everything is withdrawn, everything is you're, you have no all the cancer is taken out with the surgical specimens, and you have clean margins. That's the, what the surgeons like to talk about margins. And so that's one way to know that you're on the way to hopefully a cure. Um, another is, is there evidence either at the time of the diagnosis or after the treatment that there's spread? And that spread could be assessed clinically. You can maybe have a lump somewhere or a new symptom, uh, a, a physical exam finding, something uh, that suggests that you have a tumor somewhere else in your body uh, or an abnormal routine blood test. You're, you're anemic or, or some other thing, something else is wrong. More commonly, we use imaging, uh, and that could be PET scans, it could be CT scans, it can be all sorts of other kinds of imaging, which we do to assess you before treatment, to assess you after treatment, and to see whether there's uh, disease remaining and whether that disease is getting bigger or staying the same or even going away. Sometimes, in some cancers, there are biomarkers that can be used, uh, not so much in non-small cell lung cancer but some. And then we also use these, these concepts like five-year progression, five-year overall survival to evaluate the treatments, right? How long do people live uh, without, uh, uh, how long do they survive after uh, a treatment? Is it five years? How long is, do they have progressions, free survival? Uh, and, you know, how do they measure that? Those are, those are progression, which is usually uh, an imaging or clinical assessment. Uh, overall survival is usually a, a, whether you're still alive in five years or not. And then there are these intermediate criteria or uh, which uh, are a set of, of either imaging findings or other kinds of assessments which allow one to say that a treatment is beneficial or not. And is very important, by the way, in the clinical trial process. I think all of these are components of how we think about a cure in lung cancer, but really a cure is you, f you or your loved ones uh, feeling uh, like the disease is controlled and gone. And uh, we're, we've developed a test which will move, I think, move the field closer and closer to a day when you can feel more secure uh, that your disease is gone, when it is gone, and it's when it's not gone uh, is it can be a better target for the treatments uh, that are available. And with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague. Great. So I think we actually have a few slides prepared. If we can pull those up. So while we're pulling those up, I think it's important to really distinguish our test from some other liquid biopsy tests you might have heard about. So when we all think about liquid biopsy, I think we frequently think about a blood-based test to really look for actionable or targetable mutations. For example, looking for an EGFR mutation when there's not enough tissue. Or for a patient, for example, on Tarsiva, who may be progressing, finding a T790M mutation to possibly consider the next line therapy, which would be Tegriso. So I think pretty much everyone probably is familiar with such tests, um, but really, what those tests are good at, which is identifying mutations, they're really not as good for actually tracking what's happening with the cancer over time. And I think a big problem that most of us are familiar with is 
what to do about scans. And I think we always have anxiety when there's time to do a scan. And sometimes the scans are just difficult to interpret. So I think just with a show of hands, how many times have you been in an oncologist's office and you know, you've had a hard time really figuring out with the oncologist what really the scan shows? You know, is there a little nodule in the liver? Is that cancer or not? Has the cancer really grown and gotten bigger or has it shrunk? So just with a show of hands, how many times have you had issues kind of really figuring out what the scan is showing? So I think all of us have that problem. And I think really we need a better solution. So I think while imaging is great, it has some limitations. We know that cancer can be very small, smaller than imaging can uh, actually be able to pick it up. And sometimes imaging cannot be very representative as actually what's going on with cancer. So I think for patients on immune therapy here, you might have heard of a, a phenomenon called pseudoprogression, where your tumor actually increases in size initially uh, when immune therapy is started and then actually shrinks down. And that can be very confusing because you can imagine that if the oncologist misinterprets that increase in size in the tumor as progression and stops the immune therapy, that could be a bad thing. Um, and it turns out that the pseudoprogression is actually occurring because the immune system in our body is attacking the tumor and the tumor is actually growing in size because it's dying from the immune system attacking it and not because the tumor is actually progressing. So at Natera, what we really focus on is developing a new liquid biopsy test to do what we call molecular tracking of the tumor. And that's basically providing a blood-based number that can be tracked over time to tell you if the cancer is getting larger, if it's getting smaller, and for many patients who may be in remission, also tell us if the cancer may be coming back. And we will show some data that we can now frequently catch cancer that's coming back months, in some instances over a year, before the cancer comes back on a scan. And that really opens some new therapeutic possibilities for either catching the cancer earlier when it's coming back, it's still a manageable or curable stage, or in the future through uh, clinical trials with some of our pharmaceutical partners, actually considering treating the cancer that's coming back before it comes back clinically and is causing symptoms and may be hard or impossible to cure at that stage. So next slide. Oh, the slide is good. So I'm a hematologist. So for many hematological cancers, there are great blood-based biomarkers that we track over time. So things like BCR ABLE and CML is a marker that through simple blood tests we can track throughout the course of a patient's treatment and see if the cancer is getting smaller, if it's getting bigger, if it's coming back. For many solid tumors, such biomarkers do not exist. And that's why we really have to rely on imaging and other clinical methods to assess if the cancer is responding, not responding, or for example, if it's coming back in a patient that's been treated with curative intent. There are some cancers that are solid tumors that have such good biomarkers, for example, prostate cancer. So in prostate cancer, there's something called PSA. And if you see how many patients um, are treated with prostate cancer, there's a lot of focus on what the PSA number is doing. So sure, imaging is still used in prostate cancer, but really, because there's such a powerful blood-based biomarker, the PSA can be checked much more frequently than imaging. So you don't have to wait months for a scan, you can check it every month or every few months to get a really good granular picture about what's happening to the cancer with treatment or for a survivor to make sure that the cancer is not coming back. And really our goal in the Terra is, create, is to create a PSA for every cancer, including non-small cell lung cancer, and really kind of to empower both the patient and physician to more accurately track their cancer, um, to both detect recurrence early uh, for patients that are treated with a curative intent and for patients with metastatic disease to really better understand treatment response or progression on treatment earlier than you would with um, uh, imaging-based assessment. Next slide. I'm just going to add here uh, the, uh, another potential uh, is to not treat people who don't need treatment. There are, there are people who surgery cures them, other reasons that they're cured. They have very, and are, when the test is very low or at zero, uh, you're not in need of, many people are not in need of treatment at that point. So avoiding unnecessary treatment. Perfect. Great. So 
again, I think we're really going to spend the remainder of kind of the time we have together talking about monitoring. So I think in this case, you can see a patient with a, with a mutation, and you can see that this mutation is tracked over time. Um, and initially, the patient has a lot of tumor DNA in their blood, but then after some kind of therapy, you can see that the tumor DNA level drops. And this is just like on imaging, seeing a tumor shrink. Uh, but here, there's a lot of more power with tumor-derived DNA, and now frequently we can detect much lower levels of it than, for example, you would be able to, to detect with imaging alone. And because of that, frequently you can detect tumor DNA in the blood that either increases signifying disease progression or is detected for the first time after curative surgery to really suggest relapse much earlier than you would see on imaging. So in this example, you can see a patient basically has initially a ctDNA decrease, but after surgery, it starts trending up. And this precedes, for example, clinical relapse by, in this case, you know, 13 months. And really that starts bringing up the question, if we can detect cancer coming back sometimes a year earlier, you know, is that an opportunity for us to intervene earlier as well? be that doing more um, um, aggressive surveillance to identify a cancer when there's just one spot of it, for example, that can still be treated? Or for the first time, can we actually start thinking about treating cancer when it's coming back molecularly instead of having to wait for it to back, come back clinically and possibly actually prevent some of these cancers from coming back that are otherwise destined to come back? So really, these are some of the questions that for the first time, using a test like ours, we can start to explore. So just to add to what Alexi said, when we personalize your specific test, we choose at, in the current version 16 mutations which are unique and present in your, uh, your specific tumor that we have a sample of. Uh, usually we have that sample because you've had it operated on or you've had a biopsy. Um, and we create then, we find the 16 best mutations that we think will be stable and not, not change and become less sensitive over time and create this personalized assay for you. And then we apply it to your blood later on. And if we find two signals, two or more signals, then we call that positive and measure the amount of, that, of those uh, signals uh, in the blood. So uh, it's a complicated assay. It has 16 components to it at the beginning, but those are all relevant to your specific tumor, and that's what gives it the beautiful specificity and sensitivity um, that uh, we've done. So I think just to, in the interest of time, I want to really make sure we can now switch over right. to we, Joanne's story. We, and really, have, we have to hear Joanne's yeah, story. Make sure we have time to focus on that. Go to the next slide. The next slide. Just like it was at Cal Berkeley. All right. <laughs> so do so you want to tell your, tell your story? I mean, uh, the... Uh, the answer was that you were or the uh, let me let me say a few words about you. Yeah, How okay. about that? <laughs> and if I we get, didn't rehearse this. Right. So <laughs> we did meet. You you were you had symptoms in September of twenty sixteen, as I, I had remember. Symptoms for a year before, before that. that. But uh, you you had a cough. I you had a you had a smoking history. Twenty years or right, twenty five years given earlier. Up. Um, and were the diagnostic tests were done in September or October? Uh, do you remember? The biopsy was done in September. September. And then the, the genomic test that showed the EGFR, EGFR. a couple of weeks, took, that took a couple right. of weeks. Right. So you, at the time, you were staged as being stage four. Yes. Because you had uh, not only uh, tumor in your lung, but they thought you had tumor in your bone, in your adrenals, but not in your liver or other... Uh, other sites. No, and I also had an MRI. There were no brain mets. It no was brain mets. One adrenal gland, I forget which one, and uh, to read the scan report, every bone in my body has. <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway, they so, say. So you were started on in October of 2016 on Terceva. Yeah. And really, for uh, two years, you had a, a a pretty good response to Terceva. I did. Um, you were feeling pretty good, uh, and uh, what? How did in uh, 2018? What was what was it that 
began to worry you, or what, what was it that was the, the signal that things might be recurring in 2018? Um, nothing worried me. Yeah, no. good. <laughs> well, that's good. I was uh, interested in knowing uh, sooner rather than later uh, if there was any progression. Right. Um, and uh, my UC, as my UCSF oncologist, Dr. Blakely says, it, the, you got to stay ahead of the game. Right. And I'm not sure that the standard of care has that same, just comparing right. my PAMF oncologist with the UCSF. I don't think they have that kind of same right. mindset. Right. I'm right on right. that. Yeah. Right. Okay. So anyway, uh, any way that I could uh, know sooner that there might be progression uh, was a great thing. Right. And I heard about the... Your daughter, Sarah. My daughter, clued Sarah. Clued you in, yeah. <laughs> clued me in that yeah. there is this test going on at um, Natera, and Natera has a friends and family program, so I could be a, a patient or whatever you call a... Your, part of our study. Part of your, part of your study. And so uh, my first blood draw with you was in uh, October of 2000, 2017, which was one year right. after I'd been on Tarceba. So we got your sample. We you, got, you got and, your... and, and my uh, tissue was all at uh, yeah. down at uh, Mountain View. Dr. Krishna mm -hmm. helped yeah. me, yeah. Find, told me how to, how to get that. Mm -hmm. So you got my tissue. Mm -hmm. I met with Dr. Alishan and he got my history um, and you put it all into your lab and your research. And um, then, let's see. It, so it seemed, that was in October of 2017. You took the first lowish. blood sample. Right. And it was 0. 0.37. I don't know if you have, if you have my is chart. Next, so if we can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, yeah maybe slide. my chart was. So we can see that's the first time point. Um, the first time point is what, on the left? On the, on left, the left, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that, I don't know what the numbers mean, but that was a 0.37. So uh, I'll CT explain. Yeah, so these are mutant, so tumor molecules per milliliter. So a usual standard tube of blood is around 10 milliliters. So Joanne had in that tube of blood on average, if you take 0.37 times 10, again, that's 10 mLs of blood, you usually get drawn. So she only had 3.7 pieces of tumor DNA in that tube of blood at that time. And again, to put that in perspective, that's a pretty low number. Um, so again, there's definitely cancer in, in her body, and we know Joanne has stage four disease, so Terceva is really controlling the disease, it's not really getting rid of it, but that's a pretty low number um, in our experience. It means really there's very little cancer in the body mm -hmm. at that time. And that was two there months after, after the degree so zero. Boom. Yeah. Boom. Yep. So, and I've, I've had one draw since right. uh, in February and uh, don't have that result yet. The beginning a, of this month. Have you had a scan since the, the one that showed the PET scan? Oh, yes, I had a scan. Wait a minute. Uh, Tegreso, September. <laughs> the, um, the scan at the time of the, uh, the, the drop. chart drop yes. uh, did show stable. And then I had another scan in January that showed so stable. stable. So, what you can see here is that our test was coming up before the scans really progressed, mm -hmm. and that uh, the scan restabilized, uh, became more abnormal at the time, at the, t the peak of our, our assay. And then when, uh, after she was changed to the Tegresso, uh, both the scan stabilized and our test has dropped back down to a very low level, actually lower than she was than when she was yeah. originally diagnosed. Well, that says a lot. Which is good news. That's right. That says a lot. So and I'm waiting for the real results of the February 4th draw speak and to hope him. it's still on zero. <laughs> <laughs> Tell them you're waiting at home. They're going to come and get it. <laughs> they do. <laughs> they do. Great. They send a full bottom. That's great. Maybe a few more minutes oh, for questions. Clock. Yeah. Great. Is yeah, that my housekeeping? We also are thinking about using our test for patients who've had an exceptional response to therapy with stage four disease to really figure out which patients may be able to come off their treatment. And we know that for the first time, possibly some patients with stage four lung cancer, especially with immune therapy, may be cured with that therapy. But right now there's really not a good test to know if somebody is cured or not 
And because of that, many patients remain on immune therapy sometimes for years, sometimes five, 10 years. Um, and the question becomes, is it sometimes safe to stop? Or they keep getting CT scans right. until they die. They're getting CT scans, they're getting treatment. The treatment can have toxicity. You know, there could be side effects from prolonged immune therapy. Um, and the question becomes, can you identify patients who have no tumor DNA in their blood with stage four disease? And could you do mm -hmm. a treatment holiday or mm -hmm. consider stopping that therapy? And, and that's, that, would, that would be relevant to targeted therapies as well as maintenance chemo, right? Right. Not well, just IO. On, right. That, yeah. on that note, Dr. Blakely did point out when he saw the, that mine went to zero, he said, we still see the tumor there. He said, but it could be totally dead. It could be yeah. totally scar tissue. Mm -hmm. right. we, don't, we can't tell that. Mm -hmm. right. Exactly. So I, I uh, was recently at a meeting with uh, the physician who's the overall scientist in charge of Merck, you know, uh, the very large drug company. And he said that the single biggest, you know, and they're, they've been obviously a leader in the introduction of immunotherapy uh, for the treatment of cancer. He says the single issue that they don't know the answer to is how long they should keep people on mm -hmm. immunotherapy. They say routinely people are kept on for two years, but really we don't know if that's too short or too long. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're just now starting he, to he's, figure uh, it out. He's, he's full speed ahead trying to figure that out. Yeah. I'll be brave if you're brave I'll be brave but only if you're brave Yeah, we can both be heroes Like soldiers in their nice clothes Like soldiers in their nice clothes Together And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see So I will fight if you'll fight yeah, I will fight, but only if you'll fight Oh, we can make it through this Like sailors in a tempest Like sailors in a tempest Together And it could be just you and me will be family. Just wait and see. So I'll be brave if you're brave. I'll be brave, but only if. 